Uh, um, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here and be able to present some of the work that I did um, during my postdoc and continuing through now as a, a junior group leader in, in, in Mexico at the UNAM. So this is a, a picture of the main uh, library in the university in the main campus in the south. Um, it's a very large university campus, very large university, the main public university in Mexico. And um, that's where the I'm based now with my research group. And so the title of the talk is Virological and Immunological Outcomes Following SARS-CoV-2 Infection in a Longitudinal Household Cohort. And so as Georgia mentioned, the, the kind of pandemic uh, arrived whilst I was doing my postdoc and we veered towards SARS-CoV-2 and have been working on continuously on this longitudinal cohort since the start of the, the pandemic. So just as an outline, I'll talk a little bit just about SARS-CoV-2 tropism and some of the aims of the fine cohort and the design of the cohort. Um, what we found in terms of the natural history of viral shedding and how that's modulated by vaccination history, antiviral therapy and different uh, infections with different variants. And then look a bit on, uh, on the data we have on the neutralizing antibody response dynamics in the cohort and, and really try and tie those two together, which is kind of one of the unique things about this cohort where we were able to look at the effects of neutralizing antibodies on viral load and then look at the effect of viral load on the emergence or, or recall of neutralizing antibody responses after breakthrough infection. And I'll just finish off with what we found in terms of the evidence for immune imprinting in, in the neutralizing antibody responses in the cohort. So as we all know very well by now, um, SARS-CoV-2 has this kind of very broad tissue tropism in the body, can infect many organs and many cell types. And obviously, this is linked to the very acute symptoms in the upper and lower respiratory tract that can lead to very severe outcomes, including death. Uh, but also the what's becoming more recognized lately, the kind of um, association with uh, uh, prolonged symptoms that have uh, uh, symptoms in different uh, organ systems of the body, and this is linked to infections in in a wide range of different tissues like the gastrointestinal tract or the central nervous system. So in the cohort, um, I'll talk today mainly about sampling that was done in, in, in nasal, from nasal samples and blood samples that were taken to measure uh, immune responses but also saliva and stool and ice, uh, samples from the eye were, were taken in this cohort. And the, the idea really was quite simple from the onset was to look at the natural history of shedding dynamics, how that was modulated by vaccination and variant infections, and how that impacted on household transmission and community transmission. Um, in, in this kind of, in an outpatient cohort that were mostly mild infections. So this was a longitudinal observational study um, that has actually uh, just finished, uh, is wrapping up in November, of household infections. So these are outpatient community infections within households um, based in, recruited from the San Francisco Bay Area and set up to characterize in detail the infectious period, so the duration of infectivity, the duration of viral RNA shedding, and the household level of uh, incidence of transmission, and how these, these outcomes are modulated by vaccination and infections with different variants of concern. And so the, the, the kind of design was to try and capture uh, the whole period of the natural history of, of the shedding dynamics. And to do this, we would um, uh, uh, look at registries of people who have had confirmed uh, diagnosis of, of SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, recruit them if they were within five days of symptom onset and were isolated at home and lived with other household contacts. And they would generally be on the downslope of their viral shedding um, uh, pattern. 
Um, and their contacts, the, the idea would be that they were uh, all COVID negative at the time of recruitment. They cohabited with the infected index case, had no recent symptoms. And, and in them, we were able to capture in a large number of them, um, the, the kind of, say, in some people, even before the infection started and, and, and follow the whole course uh, over a month of their uh, acute infection. And to do this, the, the, the study field team would um, uh, do house visits to um, collect enrollment samples and leave a freezer and instruct the uh, participants to uh, swab daily their nose and put them in, in, in uh, storage media and then freeze down those samples at minus 20, uh, collect saliva as well. And then on weekly visits, they would collect these samples and we would store them at minus 80 for long term storage and that's how we were able to kind of sample very intensely um the the sampling uh schedule uh included daily nasal swabs uh for first two weeks of infection and then on day 17 19 21 and 28 uh, uh kind of tied to the days post symptom onset of the index case in the contact cases as well and serum was collected uh, weekly uh, from uh, the day of enrollment weekly up until uh, day 28 post-symptom onset of the index case. And these uh, patients were then, participants were then um, invited to uh, be followed up longer in and enroll in a long COVID study uh, to look at um, long-term consequences of infection. And this is a, a real uh, asset of this, uh, this uh, cohort is that we're able to look at um, a, uh, um, acute um, uh, um, factors that may be involved in the development of some of these long, long COVID uh, outcomes. And this is something that hopefully I can work with with Georgia um, in the future um, in, in collaboration with, with the ICGEB. But I'll talk to, uh, today about this acute stage. And so some of the assays that we would carry out were uh, QPCR to to measure uh, RT QPCR to measure the RNA dynamics, and we looked at absolute quantities with a standard. Um, we sequenced the infecting variant using the nanopore protocol, Arctic nanopore protocol. Um, the infectious shedding duration was assay assayed by a CPE assay in the BSL three. So I spent most of the pandemic in BSL three. Uh, uh, looking at the duration of infectivity from the nasal samples and saliva samples from the cohort. Just uh, to mention, we used Vero Tempris 2, Human ACE 2 uh, transgenic cells, and these re really had high sensitivity. Um, you may be able to appreciate the formation of syncytia uh, once these cells were infected versus uh, just normal Vero E6 cells or ones expressed in Tempris 2 only that just clumped up and died. But in the ACE, human ACE2 cell, cells, um, they made these characteristic syncytia, which gave us a, 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 another indication of the specificity of the infection. And um, the effect was very rapid, very high sensitivity, often uh, above CTs of 30. And at the start, when people have trouble with isolating Omicron, these cells were great for uh, isolating Omicron. And then these uh, CPE effect was confirmed by uh, RTQPCR. We also measured neutralizing antibody titers by uh, pseudotype assay. And so um, the, the, the um, study really spanned um, the 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 period of of the pandemic here's just a um uh, a graph showing the emergence of different variants of concern over time in north america and that how that coincided with the uh, development of or the availability of different vaccination schedules um and so most unvaccinated individuals were infected with pre-variant of concern in the study uh, primary, well, those who received the primary series had Delta infections. Many monovalent uh, booster uh, recipients had Omicron, BA1 and BA2, and, and, and bivalent boosters were mostly um, XBB 1.5 infected individuals. And then at some point, you know, 
Paxlovid treatment came along, and I'll talk a bit about that. And also there is the context of viral breakthrough infections, which started to uh, increase in, in incidence and reinfections, which further kind of complicated the immunological landscape of, of these individuals. And there's a lot more heterogeneity in terms of uh, infection history and vaccination history. And so the study period really spans kind of like the first half, starting the first half of 2020 up until um, what I'll talk about today, which is uh, the, the period of, of XBB 1.5 infections. And just to look at some of the, the numbers, there were 234 infected individuals in, in the cohort in this time point, time frame. Um, 96 uninfected individuals. These were, as I say, non-severe infections. At the time of infection, there were no hospitalizations. Um, we excluded those under antiviral therapy, and I'll talk a bit about why. Um, the analysis was fo focused mainly on adults, and um, most participants received RNA vaccines, the vast majority, uh, Pfizer, Moderna, uh, as a primary series, uh, boosters and bivalent boosters were mainly um, BA5 containing um, bivalent boosters. And so when we sequenced the the um, the uh, patient samples, we found a you know a kind of representation of the of the different variants over time, um, uh, pre variants of concern, a lot of delta infections. And then different Omicron subvariant infections up to XBB 1.5. So, the first uh, little story I'll talk about is a comparison we did initially on primary series vaccinated individuals and unvaccinated individuals and their shedding dynamics. So, when we compared um, the maximum viral load between unvaccinated and fully vaccinated individuals, we actually found no difference in these maximum viral loads uh, between these two groups. However, um, the decay dynamics of the uh, RNA shedding was uh, uh, faster in those that had been fully vaccinated as two doses or full primary series of, of vaccinations. We then looked at the proportion of nasal samples with infectious virus over time um, and comparing vaccinated, unvaccinated individuals. This uh, table below just shows the number of specimens that were assayed uh, at a particular time point. We found no difference in the proportion of, uh, of samples that had infectious virus within the first five days. But after five days, there was a significant reduction in the proportion of samples that had infectious virus in fully vaccinated individuals. And we then looked to see um, whether that had an impact on household transmission. Then the effect on 14-day cumulative household transmission, uh, we, we found no effect on 14-day on, on, on cumulative household transmission. And this, we also found that 81% of the contacts were infected within five days of symptom onset when there was no difference in the proportion of infectious samples, um, and and when and and so this led to no no significant differences in the in the uh, the the uh, the proportion of individuals household contacts that were infected, be they unvaccinated va vaccinated uh, index cases to contacts or index vaccinated in index cases to vaccinated contacts. And so most household transmission occurred within five days of symptom onset. Infectious shedding in nasal samples was reduced only after five days of symptom onset. And so vaccination had no notable effect on, on transmission dynamics in the household. So we then uh, uh, look, analyzed further on in the cohort after this initial publication, looking at individuals who were boosted and who had received a bivalent booster with a BA5 containing antigen. And th so these are the, the kind of summary graphs of individuals uh, and their, their log N uh, viral load, RNA viral load. And then if they have a uh, purple uh, dot, 
that means that they had that sample had infectious virus over time. And you can see, you know, people shedding infectious virus up to 15 days in in in, in some cases, but most of the infection uh infectivity was centered around this kind of first week post-symptom onset up to beyond five days. Um, so um, we excluded Paxlovid-treated individuals, and I'll talk a bit about that in a second. Um, we essentially found no differences, again, in maximum viral load between the different vaccination regimes. Um, in, in the colors, you can see the infecting viral variant or uh, if the different patients in, in, in the different uh, vaccination schemes, um, and there was no difference in maximum viral load. However, we did see a significant reduction in the duration of days of infectious viral shedding in those who had received a bi bivalent booster vaccination. These were mainly infected with XBB 1.5 uh, viruses. And um, so there was a shortening, a significant shortening um, to uh, within five days of symptom onset um, in terms of uh, the duration of, of uh, infectious viral shedding. Um, so I mentioned that we'd excluded Paxlovid treated individuals. And this is because obviously uh, these this, this antiviral that targets the and protease can have an effect on the viral decay dynamics, which is really what it's designed to do and kind of make that viral decay even steeper. But what we also found, and this has been uh, discussed in the literature to some extent, is this phenomenon of viral rebound, whereby um, there's a, a rebound not only of RNA, but actually of infectious virus in many instances. Um, we can see here, uh, in, in blue is the detection of infectious virus and you have this kind of dip and then this this rebound uh, in, in many instances in some that really prolong the, the infectious period for almost a, a month. And um, this was actually this, this kind of uh, phenomenon was observed in 23% of uh, Paxlovid treated individuals in the cohort. Uh, both XBB 1.5 and BA5 infected individuals. And so this, you know, has implications for transmission dynamics in Paxlovid treated individuals and really what underpins why some individuals uh, experience rebound and others don't is not well understood. And so uh, we looked at the effect of vaccination and and. and uh, antivirals on, on shedding. And then we turn to look at the effect of viral variant. So uh, uh, initially we, we looked at um, the effect of Omicron BA1. And as we all remember, it kind of um, uh, led to this massive uh, wave of infections that was, uh, you know, first described in Southern Africa, where it likely uh, emerged this variant and uh, rapidly spread around the world, causing a huge uptick in, in cases and rapidly displacing the Delta variant that had been prevalent. It's a, a neutralizing antibody escape variant. And um, here's just some recent data from North America looking at the attack rate it, across different states in the United States um, uh, versus more recent Omicron uh, lineages, and we can see this kind of almost 50% of individuals were infected uh, across US states uh, with, with Omicron BA1. So at this really, really uh, high attack rate compared to any other variant that we've seen. Um, however, when we looked at the shedding dynamics and we looked at the maximum viral load of patients, participants with BA1 infections, we found something that was kind of uh, counterintuitive. They actually had lower copies of RNA 
and 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 this coincided with lower copies of infectious virus that we titrated by plaque assay so this was a direct plaque assay from nasal specimens showing that indeed they had uh lower titers of infectious virus um and rna copies than delta and pre delta variants but were still able to um completely um displace the 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 delta variant and in fact when we looked at the duration of infectious viral shedding there was no difference in the duration between delta and ba1 viruses in in our participants but when we looked at the ct values of um samples that contained infectious virus consistently the amount of rna was much lower in infectious samples from omicron compared to delta or pre omicron in this case um suggesting that the kind of threshold for viral rna uh, rna for infectivity which mu was much lower in ba1 versus previous uh variants and this was something that we i think we still don't understand completely the biology by which ba1 was so infectious having uh lower uh um, viral titers so uh we then expanded this analysis to look at the effect of um different variants on shedding dynamics and so on the left here is uh maximum viral load by different variant and again we you know we we see this effect of ba1 to some extent a lower maximum viral load of ba2 but the more recent omicron variants had similar um peak vi maximum viral loads compared to pre omicron variants and uh, although in delta and some of these pre omicron pre delta variants there were um higher uh, viral loads in in some participants than you would get in 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 more recent um uh, variant infections and these are colored by their vaccination history so again we can see the most of the xbb 1.5 infections were people who had received booster vaccinations and so when we look at the infectious period again we see this effect whereby xbb 1.5 infected individuals had fewer days of of shedding infectious virus a number had no infectious virus at all um and so rather than attributing this to the variant this seems to be a, a, an effect of bivalent uh, vaccine boosters in in these individuals um so it seems like uh, the 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 effect on shedding from bivalent booster vaccines was was uh, significant in 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 these people who had xbb 1.5 infections um so just to summarize this this section uh vaccination can decrease the likelihood of being infectious after 5 days that's true with the kind of standard primary vaccination schedules but this didn't have an effect on household transmission because most transmission occurred after 5 days of uh symptom onset uh however back, bivalent vaccination may have an impact on household transmission and this is something we we'll, we are analyzing currently um because it had a significant reduction in terms of the days of uh of the duration of infectivity paxlovid treatment can lead to rebound of infectious virus and prolong the infectious period and so this definitely has implications for community transmission and isolation guidelines um and so one really there's a need to kind of take this these data into account in 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 the treatment guidelines when when paxlovid is used um in terms of omicron there was this massive ba1 spike that occurred around the world this occurred despite reduced peak infectious viral load uh the duration of shedding was similar between pre omicron variants and ba1 uh or an infectious ba1 was detected at high ct value so so with very little rna so we suggest that there's a reduced barrier to infection for ba1 compared to previous variants so you just needed a, 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 a much lower inoculum to be infected with ba1 uh, and this uh um the biology behind this is uh um interesting and, and merits further investigation 
Um, so uh, when we compared with uh, other Omicron variants, BA1 and BA2, to some extent showed this reduced peak viral load uh, phenotype. Um, the, uh, however, recent Omicron variants replicate to similar extent as pre-Omicron variants. And the duration of infectivity of XBB1-5 infections was reduced. Um, and this is likely due because of these patients receiving bivalent booster vaccinations. So um, I'll, I'll now move on to the data we have on neutralizing antibody responses. And so um, to look at this, we used a pseudotype uh, HIV pseudotype assay, switching out the spike uh, sequence for different variants, including the, the kind of wild type vaccine strain, Wuhan in this case, Wuhan, and alpha beta P1 uh, immune escape variants, epsilon and delta, which were prevalent in North America, and BA1 and BA2. So this data only goes up to individuals who had uh, BA2 infections and received booster vaccination. And so just to remind you that the serum was collected weekly after enrollment into the study. And so we looked at these uh, dynamics uh, over this uh, acute period of infection. And uh, here, here are the, the, the kind of raw data um, in terms of the shedding, the sorry, the neutralizing antibody response dynamics is the neutralizing antibody titers over time, days post symptom onset in unvaccinated primary, those who received a primary series and <clears throat> boosted, these were not bivalent boosters, just uh, an additional wild type booster, one or two boosters uh, combined. Um, so in un unvaccinated individuals, uh, neutralizing antibodies were mostly undetectable for the first seven days. Um, uh, whereas in, in those who had received uh, vaccinations and had vaccine breakthrough infections, there was a baseline neutralizing antibody titer that uh, remained stable over the first week and then kind of rose uh, over into day 14 post-symptom onset. Um, vaccine, uh, neutralized antibody responses peaked around day 21 and day 28 post-symptom onset. And um, in those who'd received a primary vaccine series, there was a 33 uh, uh, fold change, th 33 times fold change in the peak neutralizing antibody response versus baseline. Um, and 10x in those who would receive booster vaccinations. And these graphs are again colored by the infecting variant that the patient was infected by. So most booster, all booster vaccination, uh, well, all those who received booster vaccinations had BA1 or BA2 infections and most primary <coughs> um, uh, series vaccinations had Delta infections. So we can see that the primary series vaccination had a, a higher fold change than those with booster vaccinations. So uh, the first observation that we saw com directly comparing these groups was that the baseline neutralizing antibodies were higher in those who'd received a booster vaccine versus a primary uh, vaccine series. Again, these are colored by the infecting variant. Um, and we went to some trouble to assess whether these baseline neutralizing antibody responses were reflective of what was there before the infection, because often we, we caught these participants enrollment uh, once they were uh, PCR positive. Um, but when we compared the titers with the uninfected uh, groups that were had received a similar vaccination series, we found no difference in the titers of the baseline neutralizing antibodies in an infected versus uninfected individuals, suggesting that the baseline neutralizing antibodies represented those prior to, to infection. And so we were happy that these were really kind of baseline pre-infection or quasi pre-infection titers. Um, so then we, we looked to the relationship between baseline neutralizing antibodies and viral shedding dynamics. And just by this univariate analysis, we found a uh, um, 
a negative correlation between the maximum viral load um, and the baseline neutralizing antibody. So the higher the neutralizing antibodies, the lower the maximum uh, viral load were in, in participants. And similarly, the duration of infectious viral shedding was negatively correlated with baseline neutralizing antibodies. And so to like further uh, assess these relationships, we uh, use multivariate linear regression uh, model to assess the influence of baseline neutralizing antibodies, time since last vaccination, age and infecting variant. Uh, all of these factors uh, uh, associated with maximum RNA viral load or the duration of infectious virus shedding. Um, and we, we found a significant uh, association as we in this multivariate model, as we did with the univariate analysis, whereby baseline neutralizing antibodies predicted maximum viral load and the duration of infectious virus shedding. Uh, for every uh, increase, log increase in neutralizing antibodies, there was a 1.29 log reduction in peak viral load and a 2.5 day reduction in duration of infectious viral shedding um, um, in, in, in the cohort. So baseline neutralizing antibody titers were really strongly predictive of the shedding dynamics. We also saw this... Uh, reduction uh, of uh, maximum RNA load associated with BA1 infection, as we've seen previously. Um, so, so that suggested that baseline neutralizing antibodies were really important in determining the duration of infectivity. We then looked at the kind of factors that um, um, were associated or modulated neutralizing antibody induction after vaccine breakthrough infection or, or regular infection without vaccination. Um, so we looked at the maximum neutralizing antibodies against different infecting variants. We found that those who had received a primary vaccination series and that were mostly infected with Delta variants had the highest uh, peak neutralizing antibody response compared to boosted or certainly unvaccinated individuals. Um, we also looked at the breadth of uh, maximum neutralizing antibody titers. So in those that were unvaccinated and had received uh, mostly infected with, with pre-variant of concern variants, they had significant immune escape in P1 and beta variants, an almost a complete immune escape with uh, BA1 and BA2. Um, uh, just to mention that unvaccinated individuals had a very uh, inconsistent uh, maximum neutralizing antibody titers. And so really uh, to, to, be, to, to be able to have predictable titers, vaccination was necessary. Um, those who had received a primary series and mostly had Delta breakthrough infections had very high titers, even higher than the vaccine antigen to Delta and Epsilon. No immune escape against P1 and Beta, but some immune escape uh, was observed with B1, BA1 and BA2 variants in, in Delta vaccine breakthrough infections. And those who had Omicron uh, vaccine breakthrough infections that were boosted, had booster vaccinations, had the, the highest breadth of neutralizing antibody response with no significant decrease uh, in, in, in responses to BA1. So there was a, a de novo response against BA1 and BA2 uh, 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 variants that was um, uh, acting and, and, and elicited in, in, a, in a strong manner after breakthrough infection. Um, Yep. So, um, so we were then interested to see how viral load uh, had an effect on on um, maximum neutralizing antibody titers. We saw a positive correlation between the maximum viral load experienced by the patient and the neutralizing antibody fold change. So here we looked at the fold change in neutralizing antibody titers 
to look at the magnitude of neutralizing antibody induction. And we focused only on vaccine breakthrough infections that had a baseline neutralizing antibody titer. So in those participants, the full change uh, was associated with the maximum neutralizing antibody titer. Um, we then further looked at this in a, a multivariate model, um, looking at the effect of maximum viral uh, RNA load, time since last vaccination, the age of the participant and the infecting variant. And we found, um, sorry, we found a significant uh, association, predictive association of maximum nasal RNA load with the uh, fault change in neutralizing antibodies from baseline, but also time since last vaccination. This seems to be associated. So the longer one goes without a vaccine, perhaps the baseline neutralizing antibody titer is reduced. So then the fault change is increased. Um, um, uh, the longer you are, uh, are without your last vaccination. And also BA2 uh, infection was associated with a reduced, uh, a negative association with the full change in neutralizing antibody titer. So we were curious about this and, and curious to see whether there may be an effect of uh, immune imprinting whereby uh, that would kind of limit the ability to respond to uh, variants, uh, the immune escape variants like BA2. So immunological imprinting is, is this phenomenon um, that was kind of described initially in influenza uh, uh, vaccination and infection, whereby your uh, initial exposure, your, your initial antigen exposure um, leads to the emergence of B cell populations that upon re-exposure to kind of variant antigens are uh, preferentially uh, uh, stimulated to produce antibodies that may uh, bind to kind of conserved epitopes, um, masking any kind of de novo response to epitopes that are, are uniquely found in the variants. And so this is a concern with SARS-CoV-2 that, you know, wild type vaccination or infection, subsequent infection or, or, or uh, variant uh, vaccination may lead to selection of B cell populations that are producing these broadly neutralizing antibodies that, uh, you know, may lead us down a path eventually that you, you find an escape variant that, uh, that these antibodies are a weakly neutralizing and uh, the, the inability to, to make um, uh, de novo responses, true de novo responses from, from naive B cell populations against new uh, novel antigens. And so that's the concern. And there seems to be a lot of um, uh, uh, data emerging about the role of immune printing in, in in SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination. Um, so to, to kind of assess this, we looked at the, um, this uh, an analysis restricted to individuals with previous vaccinations. So only people who are vaccinated either with primary or boosters infected with Delta or BA1 variants. And we looked at the fold change, so the induction of neutralizing antibodies uh, targeting the Wuhan variant or the variant, the infecting variant of that participant. And certainly for BA1, BA2 infections, we, so we saw a significant induction of variant-specific neutralizing antibodies that was higher than those induced towards the vaccination strain. So this indicates to me that there is an induction of de novo responses that are targeting novel epitopes Otherwise, they, we would see a similar rise in, in these kind of similar epitopes in the Wuhan strain. Um, we further assess this um, directly by comparing unvaccinated individuals who are, who are infected with Omicron infections to those who had received the primary series and boosters. And we, we found no evidence that unvaccinated individuals had a superior response than those that had 
previous um, um, uh, vaccinations with with different uh, with the, with the kind of wild type antigen. So in my mind, we we, we don't see strong evidence for immune imprinting. However. Um, there is in the literature quite a, a body of work that, that suggests that Im immune imprinting is occurring. Um, one of the ways that has been observed is this kind of hybrid immune dampening that has been described in these kind of high profile um, publications, whereby individuals who had received three MR mRNA vaccinations uh, were compared to those who were previously infected and then received the mRNA vaccinations. And in those who had been previously infected, there was this kind of lack of response after the Omicron uh, uh, breakthrough infection versus those that hadn't been infected before and just had the mRNA vaccines, there was this induction. So there was this kind of hybrid immune dampening that was observed. This is different to the case that we have in our cohort because our, our participants were not infected before receiving their vaccinations. So this is kind of a separate case. And just to mention that in another uh, report, not looking at vaccination, but just the repeated infections, those that had been previously infected with uh, uh, a variant and then had Omicron infection had superior induction of neutralized antibodies than those just with uh, Omicron infections. So, so this kind of a complicated picture that's not very well understood why uh, previous infections be before mRNA vaccinations leads to this dampening, hybrid immune dampening. And, and the other um, uh, explanation for or evidence for immunological impotent has been suggested in a number of other high profile publications where the model is really that you 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 have this classical induction of memory B cells um, upon uh, breakthrough. In, these are induced by vaccination, and upon breakthrough infection, these cross reactive memory B cells are the ones that are producing the antibodies that are being uh, recalled during the breakthrough infection and lead to this kind of uh, broad. Uh, protective immunity and the contribution of naive B cells is limited um, to this pool of, of, of novel antibodies. And then new rounds of maturation in the germinal center may lead to maturation of these, uh, these kind of broadly, broadly acting neutralized antibodies. And so this has been suggested in, in a number of, of, of publications. And, and it, it may be the case that we're observing something along these lines. Um, so just to, to summarize this, um, this as well, uh, baseline neutralizing antibody titers are key. So I hope I convinced you about this. This is kind of the key takeaway. Baseline neutralizing antibody titers are key predictors of viral replication dynamics and transmission. We quantified the contribution of neutralizing antibodies to viral control and the duration of infectivity. And so we still need to see the relative contribution of T cells and other arms of the immune system to viral control. And there's been a lot of work on T cells, uh, but not quantifying their, their direct effect on reduction in viral load. Some work has been done on, on animal models, but less so in, in human cohorts. Um, peak viral load is a key determinant of recall neutralizing antibody responses following vaccine breakthrough infection. Consequently, variants that replicate to lower titers like BA1 or BA2 are less immunogenic um, and baseline neutralizing antibodies we found were higher in Omicron versus Delta infections due to booster vaccination. So the baseline in a boosted vaccine individual is going to be higher than one with a primary series. And therefore, the full change in neutralizing antibody titer was further reduced in Omicron versus Delta infections. Um, so we, we suggest that A, Delta replication dynamics were higher than Omicron dynamics, and B, those infected with Omicron had a higher baseline neutralized antibody. So those two factors contributed to lower um, uh, fold changes in, in, in the Omicron versus Delta comparisons. And Despite low neutralizing antibody titers, Omicron vaccine breakthrough infections induced a broad maximum neutralized antibody response, including against Omicron variants. 
Um, and we observed evidence of the induction of the novel neutralizing antibody responses against Omicron variants. So this kind of is in contrast a little bit to this model that is kind of prevalent at the minute. And what we would like to test is whether variant viral load is um, or we hypothesize is associated with perhaps an increase in the contribution of the naive B cell pool to the induction of, of uh, uh, de novo neutralizing antibody responses in breakthrough infection. Um, brilliant. So, so that's uh, basically the, the story I, I have for you today. I really want to thank everyone who has been uh, working on the project, but first of all, initially the participants who you know, really endured uh, intense sampling uh, from from uh, the study. Uh, I was in Raul Andino's lab uh, during this period of my postdoc. Uh, really want to thank Michelle Tassetto and Amethyst Sang, who was our technician, who did a lot of the um, QPCR work. The clinical team, the study was led by Dan Kelly at UCSF um, and the large team of uh, clinicians and epidemiologists. Um, who I'd like to thank, and the CDC as well. This was a CDC-funded study, um, and the, the team at the CDC for their guidance and, and input throughout. And thank you very much for listening, and uh, happy to answer any questions.